once again, thank you, everyone. So let me just, uh, you know, before I jump into my presentation, because we've got some amazing content to share with you today, I want to take a step back and just give you a, a brief introduction into uh, who I am and a little bit about B2C product marketing. So who is B2C product marketing? As the name suggests, we are uh, a company, an agency that really helps startups and brands do three things. One, define products. Two, go to market, and three, help them to grow. Um, <clears throat> our agency has over 30 years of collective experience with a key focus on the B2C space, tech, and fintech. We've launched over 100 products globally, and we're leaders in the B2C product marketing space. And ultimately, and while we're giving this presentation today, we're master cross-pollinators. So next, uh, what I want to say is that we're leaders in a rare but growing area. Um, so the Product Marketing Alliance had basically did a recent survey in 20, uh, 2022 and said they found that there's only, of all the marketers in the world, there's only 2% that are product marketers, right? And then when you sort of like break that down further, the number of people who like of those product marketers who focus on the B2C space is so much smaller. It's only 16%. While it's growing year on year, it's grown 400%. It's a small pool of people who have this expertise that we've garnered throughout the years. Um, and so I'm really excited to be able to share that with you and um, you know, your portfolio companies and you know, for you and your startups, because we are the leaders in this area. We have like years of experience and we've been able to use what I would say is you know, this cross-pollination blueprint for growth. And we've cracked the code on, I'll use it repeatedly to drive success and growth for like a lot of the companies and startups that we've worked on. Um, and so we want to share this knowledge with you. So before we go into what this blueprint is, I think we want to take a step back and go, okay, what is cross-pollination, right? So I went into dictionary.com and I said, okay, what does cross-pollination mean? So there's two definitions. The first definition is around this idea of, you know, the idea of the bee, right, that transfers pollen from one flower to another flower of a different, you know, type of genetic makeup to, you know, really, you know, um, you know transfer and cross-pollinate, right? Now, what happens is, if I put it into simple terms, the bee has, you know, you can see in this picture here, has hair on its body. And then when it lands on one flower, it, you know, the pollen attaches to the hairs and then it flies to another type of flower or plant and that pollen falls off and then that's how it cross-pollinates. And so why I sort of you know, bring this up is that when you think about the bee, the bee is small, but through the act of cross-pollination, they are so critical to our ecosystems. Why? Because without them, you don't get so many of the fruits and vegetables that you eat. Now, anyone who had coffee this morning or still having coffee, um, you, you wouldn't have your coffee. There's so many medicines that use you know, products from cross-pollination. <clears throat> and then also a lot of animals who eat like the crops that are a result of cross-pollination would die, right? Um, so in addition to cross-pollination giving you all the core things and being so critical to the ecosystem, what it also does is it gives you new species of different fruits and vegetables that you know, often happen. Now, what was the second definition of cross-pollination, right? And I think there's a, like a strong connection between the first definition and the second definition. So the second definition on dictionary.com was around this idea of sharing or the interchange of knowledge and ideas for mutual enrichment and cross-fertilization, right? So when you think about like, you know, the idea of like the bee and how it cross-pollinates and how it's so critical to your ecosystem, you could also look at the idea of cross-pollination here being so critical for your you know, business, your startup, you know, because similar to a bee, you know, when you take one idea from you know, one team and you cross-pollinate it into another area of the business, what happens is you end up with like um, development of stronger products or different product solutions that are really innovative. And that's why, you know, when we were thinking about this idea of cross-pollination, it was really integral to our why, right? Like our mission and why we are in the business of what we do. And what we do is this. We um, at B2C Product Marketing, we cross-pollinate the product and marketing strategies, right, to cultivate balanced growth for B2C startups and businesses. 
And that's really why we're in business and we're passionate about it. We're passionate about helping businesses thrive and grow. And why is this important? Okay, so in a recent, and let me tell you why, right? Because in this in this recent survey by the Fallery, they surveyed failed startups, right? Um, I think there was like about 84 of them. And this is the most recent data I could find. There was a number of other sources, but this was the most recent one. And of those, you know, surveyed failed startups, 74% of failed startups cited three key reasons. One, lack of product market fit. Two, wrong marketing strategies. Three, team and HR. And I'll just uh, double click a little bit in each one. So, uh, you know, the lack of product market fit is like they developed a product, but it didn't really satisfy the needs of the customer. It didn't add value, right? Uh, you know, when it came to wrong product, uh, wrong marketing strategies, it was around, you know, no, not being able to compete, not being able to retain the customer, not having adequate market size and a lack of focus, right? And then when it came to team and HR issues, it was around, you know, not having the team with enough experience, not having the team that, you know, and there was always friction within the teams, right? And so when we saw this, we saw that a real opportunity for us to take this knowledge around cross-pollination that we garnered over decades and share it with startups because we knew from talking to a lot of the startups in our industry, we knew that um, this was happening a lot. And I want you to pause here and really start thinking there's a lot of entrepreneurs and, and startup founders here. Do you see this within your organization, within your startup? Do you see this constant tug of war between product and marketing teams or product and marketing strategies? Um, you know, like, do you see this like push and pull, right? And, you know, while in this picture, it shows people are smiling and happy and, and having fun with it, the reality is, if this is happening in your business, it's not fun. It's not fun at all. It's actually quite frustrating. And what this actually leads to is five common problems that I've often seen in startups, right, and also in businesses when they don't have the product and marketing teams aligned. So one is the obvious one is that you don't have product marketing teams aligned, and so there's like this constant push and pull. Two, you don't end up with, you know, product market fit or you end up with low usage because you don't truly understand the customers and the, the problems that you're trying to solve. And then, you know, not everyone's aligned around that mission. And so that leads to inconsistent um, you know, strategies. Three, you end up with products that are not really differentiated. Four, you end up with really chaotic go-to markets. Like, you know, in the previous slide there, you saw that the push and pull, it's really chaotic because it's not clear what the strategy is because there's like that the tug of war happening. And then five, you end up with inconsistent messages. What that means is, you know, like whether or not it's the product experience or across marketing touch points on the web, on email, it's inconsistent. And this creates kind of a little bit of confusion to your customers. It takes away from the confidence they have in your business. Now, you know, when we talk about cross-pollination of product and marketing strategies, Really, in my mind, and to best illustrate it for you, it's really around bringing together the two strategy hubs that really drive your business, right? One is the product strategy hub, and the second is the marketing strategy hub. And if you think about this analogy here, like you've got someone on a bike with the two you know, hubs uh, that represent the wheels on the bike, in where, when product marketing strategies are aligned, both wheels are turning in the right, in the same direction, at the right speed, at the same speed. And so you get from point A to point B, you know, very quickly. And then you increase the speed and you get like, you know, like you get that success. However, if your product and your marketing strategies are not going in the same direction or if they're going at different speeds, what happens is that you would fall off. You wouldn't get to, you know, point A to point B, and you wouldn't get to the success. And that's what happens to your businesses or your startups when product and marketing strategies are not working together cohesively. So which takes me to what is this cross-pollination growth blueprint and this holistic approach that I've been able to use throughout my career, and I've been able to use it in a repeatable format that really drives the, the, this the cross-pollination and it really drives growth. So I'll take you through the five steps very quickly, and then we'll take you through a couple of case studies of how to take this and apply this in real-world situations. So number one 
like the most one of the most important steps is defining the need, looking at the customers, the market, and the competitive, right? And really understanding what is it that you're trying to solve for the customer, understanding like how to tie your vision to that problem and that you're trying to solve and the jobs that they're trying to do and, and giving them value, understanding what the market is and how big the opportunities, and then also the competitive landscape. And then understanding like how you can be different and how what you need it takes to be competitive. Now, once you've done step one, which is in the discovery phase and defining the need in a very succinct definition, you go to step two, which is def- now you're defining what products to build to ensure that you build the right products. So this involves defining the products and prioritizing the roadmap to ensure you can build the right products. Then step three, which is the yellow part, which is the development, you go to build the products and you got to build your go to market and you got to align the two throughout the entire process. Step four, which is you then you launch and you learn, you activate your GTM, you test your messages and tactics and you look at and you understand how the product is being used. Then step five is around, you know, applying full funnel strategies and thinking, right? So it's beyond acquiring the customer at the top of funnel. Um, it's about like getting them in, but then also driving usage, retention, and customer lifetime value. And then you'll see in my diagram here, I don't see it as a linear sort of diagram. It's a circular diagram because it's like a flywheel, right? It's a continuous process that can be repeatable and you could use constantly to really drive growth within your business. So now that I've given you like this blueprint, let me take you through like how we've applied it in two scenarios. The first scenario is like in a software development um, scenario. And then the second second one is around like a physical product. So I want to take you through what we did in Twitter and how we applied this cross-pollination blueprint to drive success in adoption um, and accelerate usage of Twitter light in emerging markets. So we go to step one, which is discovery. What did we find when we did the analysis, right? we understood that one of, through the data, one of the biggest usage barriers that was faced in some of these markets was like, like there was costly data plans, slow networks, and a lack of storage on phones, right? Now, the data at the time said that while smartphone adoption had grown to 3.8 billion connections, um, only 45% of mobile connections um, were on, far, like about 45% were on 2G um, connections, which is r- really slow. Now, you think about the Twitter app at the time. I think it was over like 100 megabytes. So imagine trying to download a 100 megabyte app on a 2G network. So basically, in simplest terms, and the key takeaway here was it it was hard and costly to download the Twitter, Twitter app, let alone use it in a lot of these markets. So what did we do? We took a step back and we said, okay, now we had a really succinct problem statement of what we from a marketing and product were going to solve for we said okay we're going to define the minimum viable product and what technology can we use in terms of using the innovation to solve that problem which is progressive web app and then what other core changes do we need to make to help deliver the best customer experience so that we can have not just a minimum viable product but a minimum lovable product right so uh, we use progressive web app in simplest terms what it was, was it's delivering an app experience, but on mobile web, right? And so, you know, what it did is by using this like innovative technology, it gave us three benefits. One, it gave us the ability to develop, you know, a a Twitter experience that wasn't really dependent on Wi-Fi quality. Two, um, you know, it was faster to download because the the Twitter um, light experience was only one megabyte and it could be saved on people's devices. So not only was it not reliant on Wi-Fi quality as much, it was faster to download on these 2G networks. And three, and probably one of the most important um, solutions, part of the solution is it gave users a native app experience. Why, uh, why was that important? Three reasons. One, it made them feel like, you know what, they were still getting the, the Twitter experience. Like it wasn't like a substandard experience. It was like something that's like similar to what other uh, Twitter users would get because it was like an app experience. Two, uh, it allowed them to put the icon onto their home screen, right? And by doing that, it made it easier for them to access and use at any time, which helped us with our ultimate goal, which was to drive usage. And then three, through our data, we knew push notifications, which is a benefit of using progressive web apps, 
was going to be enabled and it allowed us to use that to drive further engagement. So imagine now, I'm just gonna paint the picture. You're on a Twitter light. We both have Twitter light um, on our phones. And so I, and we're connected on Twitter light. Um, I tweet out something, you are connected to me. You see the fact that I've tweeted something, you would then push that uh, push notification and you go back into Twitter light. So that push notification, notification was really important to drive that engagement, right? Now, um, so that was like, okay, we've defined what we want to do. We've got the M MVP. We've got the fact that we want to use PWA. Let's go into build. Now, as we sort of went into build, a lot of emergent decisions were coming up, right? So uh, things like, okay, we knew we wanted to have data server mode. That's great. And we knew that we wanted to be able to enable into the product. But there were a lot of decisions that came up, like where does it appear? Does it go into the profile? Is it a toggle? Is it automatically turned on? You know, on the right-hand side of the screen here, you can see we show the timeline. Now, in an environment where people are disconnected or they have like really flaky networks, in the timeline, does the image get blurred? Is it a black box? If it's blurred or black box, is there a label? And if so, what fonts? So these were like emergent decisions that we had to ensure that the product strategy and the marketing strategy were constantly in, aligned. And as we made the decisions, uh, the marketing team would then you know, take that and then I would iterate on the message to ensure that we're all constantly in alignment. In addition, one of the benefits of using this model by aligning product and marketing strategies together is that it made us realize we needed to realign a budget allocation from a marketing perspective. Because at the time, Twitter had said, you know what, we're going to prioritize budget, marketing budget, only in four key markets, priority markets, we would call it. What I realized through this process was that, you know what, this is not going to cover this launch. And so through this, using this repeatable process, I was able to identify that there was a, an a opportunity for budget reallocation and really push for it to, again, realign the product and marketing strategies together. Um, so once we had done that, we were going to launch, right? And so this is the fourth uh, stage, which is around the introduction. So what we did at the introduction here is we did a global launch, but we focused on six emerging market um, active market activations. So in India, Philippines, Indonesia, Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. And in this example here, uh, we did a launch in of Twitter Lite in India with partnership with Vodafone. And what that what that partnership entailed was okay, Vodafone would send out an SMS with a link to download the Twitter Lite experience um, to their, I think it was like 200 million Vodafone users. Now, when the user got that link, they clicked on it and they were able to download the experience, right? And then when they download the experience, they had a customized like timeline experience specifically for their market. So what that meant in India was like at the time, if any of you are familiar with cricket, I'm a huge cricket, cricket lover, by the way, so I love this like uh, activation. Um, once you clicked on, you went to your home timeline, you would be able to see all the tweets around IPL cricket tournament, the players, what they were saying, the commentators, the tournament organizers. It was all curated into this like customized home timeline experience. And it was like really instrumental in kickstarting the introduction, getting more and more people to use it. Then as we went into like, like this phase where we saw people were using, we were learning from it, it was like, okay, what else can we learn and what can we do to continue to drive growth and usage? So what we did was, what we learned was, okay, these partnerships work. Um, and so we use this repeatable, you know, like template to continue to find new partnerships. Example here was a couple of months later after the initial launch, I think it was like April, May, um, we did a partnership in the Philippines for with smart um, phones and the global phone, uh, globe phones, where they did we did a some similar thing where we took the SMS, we would send it out, and then people would download it. But this time, this was a curated timeline for the Philippines market, where at the time there was a big t uh, TV show that was trending and it was gaining a lot of tweets. We had a curated timeline specifically just for that show, um, or that highlight that show, and then um, this really drove the engagement. In addition, what we realized was in a lot of these markets, some of the top use cases, why people would use the Twitter app was to engage in, you know, tweets around sports and entertainment. And so we said, okay, that we started seeing that more and more uh, bubbling up. 
And then we said, okay, we're going to build out features that support that. That included adding in polls and a number of other timeline features to really enhance the experience. And so with that, at the end of this, you know, repeatable process within, you know, like, well, I think it was like within six months, we had seen a 50% growth in Twitter like tweets, you know, and it was like a really like explosion. And it's almost like a rocket ship um, growth of like Twitter usage in these markets. So with that, I'm going to now pivot to a case study where we actually use the same repeatable process to launch, um, you know, a physical product, uh, which is like the inkjet, the brother business smart inkjet printer series. Now, I'm going to pause here and think about like, when you think about printers, you don't generally think about innovation, right? Like it's kind of like who prints these days. Um, but what I would say is this, you know, there was a, like at the time, a lot of printer manufacturers were marketing based on fees and speeds. And we said, okay, what we need to do is take a step back and what we want to do is really change the, the inkjet printing landscape, right? And so I'm going to take you through how we use this repeatable flywheel, you know, cross-pollination blueprint to help solve and you know, deliver innovation into the marketplace and drive growth. So the Brother Business Smart Series It's going to step one again in the discovery. What we found through understanding our, you know, the market, the competitive landscape, and also the user was that we found that the printer designs at the time didn't fit into the modern home with small spaces. What does that mean, right? Because what we saw from the data is more and more at the time when we were launching this is that more and more people were working from home. And when they were working from home, they were setting up these you know, small office or corporate home offices within their living rooms because there was no longer a dedicated space specifically for the homes because in a lot of metropolitan areas and where we saw a lot of um, you know, customers, space was becoming a premium. But what would happen is, you know, like when you take the existing printer design and you put it into, say, for example, the small table that you had in the living room uh, dedicated for your office or on the shelf, it just sort of stuck out because the depth was too wide. And so what it did is it didn't sit well onto the shelf or the table. In addition, the aesthetics was like, do I really want to put that printer in my living room? Um, and so we saw that there was an opportunity for us to, um, there was a need for the customer to have a beautifully sleek design printer with a much smaller footprint and, and like a, sh a shorter depth. So that was the, the one problem, the clear problem that we all aligned around that we needed to solve. Now, how did we solve that? So it was what we call print, like landscape printing technology to redesign you know, the printer from scratch. Now, let me tell you what that means. So we basically, for many of you who might have a printer, you feed paper into the printer in, in portrait format, right? And that dictates the width of the printer. Now, what we said with landscape printing technology is we would take the paper and we would turn it on its side and have it fed into the printer in landscape format. And so I'm just gonna uh, show you a quick video and then I'll talk to what this innovation was uh, in a minute. All right. So when we said we revolutionized printer design, you might be thinking, but all you did, Murray, was turn the paper in landscape. Why was that revolutionary? Okay, so when you would turn the paper to landscape, we had to, we realized we had to also change the, the print heads in the way that it printed on the paper because of the way that the, the grains on the paper would sort of like the ink would hit the paper in landscape format would cause a lot of printer jabs. So that decision to turn the paper into landscape meant that we also had to change the print, print head dis, uh, printing direction. By changing the print head to printing direction, we had to change the software because we changed the software. We also had to change the, you know, like the UX because we changed the UX. We also had to change, you know, like the user manuals and so on and so forth. So like it's basically by changing the direction of the printer, we had to re basically redesign the internal workings of the printer from the ground up. And then knowing, going back to the original problem of like what the customer wants, they wanted an aesthetically pleasing you know, aesthetic. We had to also redesign the external pieces, right? And so once we had sort of decided, okay, we know what we needed to do. We know what the solution is. We went into development mode, right? And so the development mode during this time, a lot of emergent decisions kept coming up. 
as you can imagine, when you're trying to completely redesign some, the definition of something from the ground up, right? Um, the added layer to that is we had to constantly align and cross-pollinate, right, the product, marketing, and global marketing strategies together because in, in, in this example here, you know, we might, want to, we might have developed a business smart series of printers, but the reality is the core printing solution was going to be the same across all regions with slight nuances by market. We weren't going to do a specific like series just for the UK and just for the US. There was going to be foundationally like, like the same foundation. So that meant there was a need to cross-pollinate constantly product, marketing, and global strategies together. And so in this example here, um, I'll give you an example of an emergent decision we had to, to you know, a, a, like, you know, cross-pollinate on. So touchscreen design, the UX, right? So many decisions came up. What kind of icons do we want to use? What style of icons? You know, what kind of background designs? You know, the time, is it 12 hour, 24 hour? Uh, you, know, it, you know, like what kind of fonts? So these constant decisions that we had to make, uh, we had to constantly align on that. And then as we we're making those decisions around that, we had to make sure that, you know, in parallel, you know, the, the marketing global teams were doing, developing the messaging and doing a, a lot of message testing. We did a lot of qual and quant testing with our customer base to really understand what message would resonate with them. And as these decisions came in, we would then iterate on those messages and adapt that. So by the time we were going to launch, the product and marketing strategies were aligned, right? And so when we went to stage four, which is the introduction and launch, we ended up with this message around the ultimate combination because that's what customers said resonated the most to them, right? Um, so we had this global message that everyone applied basically across their regions. But then we said, you know, each market is going to have their own local activations. So in the US, we had, um, you know, like hero presence in a lot of our key retailers and key placement in retail, in online and on flyers to really drive the usage, right? In addition, what we also did was we, we set out this warehouse space and we had different um, you know, spaces dedicated to different um, uses, environments and features because we moved away from the feeds and speeds discussion and we really wanted to paint the picture for the world and at the press about like the jobs to be done in the customers and how they would use the product in the different um, use cases. Now, and this is my last slide because I want to make sure I have a few more minutes for questions at the end. You know, at the end, um, as we're going to growth, what I can say is we drove a lot of growth for the business. Through this launch, we were able to drive, you know, re hardware revenue, which is the physical printer sales, up by 41% in the first year. But in addition, when we think about growth and lifetime value and usage and retention, we partnered with the same retailers to push the inks, right, and to really promote the inks across online, retail, and also in flyers. So we can get more customers to buy these inks, which will drive our overall revenue across ink category, across ink and also hardware um, up and really increase our you know, ROI and our lifetime value.